Well, good morning and welcome to City Hall. We're fortunate this morning to have Bob Hayes here to lead us in the invocation. Afterwards, I'll ask Larry McAtee to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Would everyone please stand? Let us pray. Gracious God and creator of all good things, in whom we live and breathe and have our being, who knows our thoughts from afar, and the words on our tongue even before we utter them. We pause in the beauty of this winter morning to give you thanks and praise for all the benefits of your mercy and your grace. And we place you first this day on the agenda of our hearts, for we know that without you we can do nothing. In this moment, I lift up a prayer for the leaders of our nation, our states, and our cities. I pray for our men and women in military service, wherever they may be, and their families, especially those in harm's way. I pray for our police and firefighters who protect our city. And in this moment, I pray for the men and women in this room who represent the countless thousands outside of these walls. To them, you have entrusted the task of governing this city, and I ask that you make them faithful in their service. Keep their hearts centered on what is good, right, truthful, and just, lest they wander off into pursuits of their own. In their discussions, give them clarity and understanding of differing views. In their voting, give them wisdom and integrity. For the, for the sake of fulfilling your mission, cause them to be good stewards of all the resources of time, talent, and money at your disposal. And bind us together by your love and cause us to know that we are all of one family created in your image to use our ordinary gifts and graces to accomplish extraordinary deeds. All this we pray. In your most holy name, amen. Amen. Face the flag, salute. I pledge, pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We're on item four of the council agenda. It's the Journal of Council Proceedings. Item 4A is to receive the Journal of Council Proceedings for January 11th. And it's also to approve the Journal of Council Proceedings for January 4th. We have a motion and a second for both item 4A and B. Cast your votes. Pass unanimously. And item five is request for uncontested continuances. Mayor, there's just one this morning on page nine. On page nine under item 8D1M. 1901 Northwest 35th Street. We ask that that be stricken. The owner has secured. Are there any other requests for uncontested continuances? All right, we'll recess the council meeting, convene as the Oklahoma City Municipal Facilities Authority. There are three items. We have a motion and a second. Any comments or questions on the MFA? All right, cast your votes. Passed unanimously. Our chairman of the MFA, convene as the Oklahoma City Environmental Assistance Trust. There is one item. All right, we have a motion and a second. Any comment or questions about the EAT? All right, cast your votes. Passed unanimously. And we'll adjourn the OCEAT and reconvene the council meeting with the consent docket. All right, are there any individual considerations? Mayor, hey. if I could, please. Yes, Meg, go ahead. Sure, I, I just would like to make a comment with regard to a couple of the items on this agenda, uh, which relate to setting the assessment roles for the uh, Business Improvement District downtown. I think it's common knowledge um, that for many years I have been a, a property investor, a significant property owner on Broadway. And in fact, my work on Automobile Alley is in large part um, what led me to my service on the council, uh, having the opportunity to work with the city for so long. And I think probably today it's appropriate just to make sure that's on the record. And um, I will excuse myself from this vote today and then any votes going forward that relate to improvements of property on Broadway. Okay. I'll uh, accept the motion then to, to exclude items G and H, and um, uh, you can excuse yourself when we get to that point. Any other comments or questions about the consent document? Your Honor, I have uh -huh. a, a quick question on X. X, all X. right. D-I-X. Okay. 
And I actually did have a question on D, if you don't mind. D? All D right. as in David. Okay. And, Mayor, we do have a presentation uh, ready to go on the parking meters on item I. Mr. Clowers is here. All right, Dennis, you want to go ahead and get us started then with the, uh, the presentation on the parking meter changes? <clears throat> yes, sir. Um, Mayor and Council, uh, Dennis Clowers, Public Works Department. <clears throat> Glad to be here this morning. Item uh, 6I uh, is the advertisement of a request for proposals to provide the parking meter system for Project 180. Uh, what I want to do is just give you an update of what has transpired to date and what we are trying to accomplish with this RFP. I'll give uh, JC just a minute to load up here. Like we're set. Okay. Go ahead to the next slide, JC. Uh, <clears throat> progress to date. Uh, the Office of Downtown Oklahoma uh, DOKC completed a survey of the users of the downtown parking meters. Uh, some of the questions in the survey included things like uh, Are you comfortable with multi spaced meters? And how important is it? to you to have uh, to be able to use a credit card in a parking meter. Other questions like that. Uh, I think they surveyed around 240, 250 users. Uh, presentations were made to our staff by three vendors. Um, these vendors were identified by the staff and by our consultant. Uh, the Office of James Jurnett, who is a consultant, and our staff prepared a preliminary layout of the single and multi-space parking meters. And then staff prepared a scope of work for the purchase of a complete part of, uh, parking meter system. The quantities included in the RFP, which are uh, 30 single-spaced meters and about 235 multi-space meters, were identified by the A&E. The final quantities will probably be less than this, depending on um, what we come up with on the final plans. The RFP does state that we do not guarantee a minimum number of meters to be purchased. And it also states that the meters are to be provided and made operational on a schedule that will be provided by the city. The three, the three vendors that, were, that made the presentations uh, were Siemens. Uh, their product is called SI Traffic Prisma and is a pay and display type machine. The next one is uh, vendor is Parkion, and their uh, product is called Strata. It, uh, they provide a pay and display as well as a pay by space machine. And the third vendor was Digital Payment Technologies. Their uh, product is called Luke, and they provide a pay by space and a pay and display uh, machine and do provide both single space meters and multi space pay stations. This map gives you an indication of the limits of Project 180 from just south of Reno to 6th Street on the north, and then from Lee on the uh, west to Gaylord on the east. It's kind of hard to see the dots uh, that are shown there, but uh, the green and blue dots are the locations that the consultant and staff have identified where uh, parking meters are appropriate. And again, uh, if you counted all the dots on here, you would come up with about 260 or so. Dennis, stop there for just a second. Okay. Uh, that is not necessarily inclusive. Or If we decided to add meters in, in locations beyond that, if the council decided to do that, we, we would be able to buy those off of this contract and expand That's it. Correct. But there's not, if we chose not to put them in all areas, there's no uh, guarantee that we would have to do that either. We have right. the flexibility to <clears throat> there's grow no, or expand as necessary. There's no minimum or maximum number in the, in the, uh, that will be in the specs. Yeah, and, and when you say 260, is that the spaces or is that the meters? That's the number of meters. Okay, the spaces, yeah. uh, if, you, if you count out uh, multi-space meters, are probably going to accommodate an average of about seven or eight spaces. If you count all those up, it's about 16, 1,700. And, and Dennis, may I ask a question about that as well? Does this contemplate all parallel parking, or does it also uh, accommodate head-in parking? I think these are all parallel parking spaces. 
So there have been some conversations ongoing about converting some of those parallel spaces to head-in or rear-end right. parking, and this is flexible enough that we can accommodate whatever changes might be included in that discussion as well. Yes, but I think all these are predicated based on parallel spaces. Uh, Dennis, how do these machines compare to the ones we have in service now? Which uh, vendor do you, are they, were they provided by one of these three vendors? <clears throat> the, um, I can't answer that question. The, the regular single space meters that we have, I don't, I don't think that those are comparable to these. these we are, do have some multiple space meters. We do. We have some on Park Avenue and some others on Main Street. I'm not sure who the vendor is. Uh, they would probably be uh, similar to them, although I think the product that we're looking for here is, has a lot more capability than the ones that, that we have in place now. And just to clarify in my mind, the, the ones we have are pay by space? They, that's correct. Okay. They are. Uh, Dennis, also the ones we have now, there, there's been some uh, criticism that they're difficult to read. Yes. And I know that's something that was looked at as we went forward, and these, I understand, are all backlit, back right. so they should be easier to, to read, so when you're looking in the sun and such, that you should be able to... There, there are very, several clauses in the specifications that require a different type of lighting, backlighting, as you mentioned, so that they're very readable no matter what the light conditions are outside. The next slide is a typical uh, section of a, uh, one of our streets downtown once we get finished with Project 180, beginning with the pedestrian zones on the outside, uh, then the amenity zone just inside that, uh, parking uh, on the outside lane of the street, bike lane, and then the vehicular lane. Uh, the meter would be generally located in the amenity zone, uh, typically one foot from the pedestrian zone. This is a perspective of what one of our uh, finished streets will look like, and the area that JC is kind of highlighting there is the amenity zone, and that's generally where uh, the parking meters or the pay stations would be located. Uh, as we've discussed, we've had we've got both types of metering downtown right now. This is an aerial view between the Norwich uh, Library and the courthouse, and this is an area on the north side of uh, Park where we do have uh, multi-space meters in place. There are also some further down east on Park Avenue near Broadway and on Main Street. The next aerial is the block uh, just east of there, east of Harvey, and this is an area where we have uh, single space meters, as is uh, the, general the general case in the downtown area. Information gathered uh, from the presentations of the three vendors indicates uh, that a meter can be configured to accept a variety of payment types, including those shown on this slide. Uh, tokens and smart cards are options, and we are really not sure if we want to use those yet or just use the coins, bills, uh, credit, and debit cards. Information gained from the uh, presentations also indicates that the meters can support either pay and display or pay by space. In the pay and display uh, method, the meter issues a receipt for a certain amount of time that the user displays on their dashboard. Uh, there are no designated spaces with these type of meter. Uh, in the pay by space, the spaces are designated and numbered such as uh, those on Park Avenue are today and the ones on Main Street as well. The new technology uh, that's available provides more than one method of payment. It also provides the ability to remotely connect to each unit in order to run reports of numbers of vehicles that are using the meters the time of day that, those, uh, that they're being used, and the payment types. It could also be used to set up the units to modify pricing during events or different times of the day. There's an option for you to either use hardwire or solar power. Uh, staff feels that the hardwired option is best for us. Uh, there would be less likelihood of vandalism, and the battery life is longer than with the solar power. Uh, we're installing the conduit to the meters, and then the vendor will pull the wire to each meter location. A solar unit can be added to each unit at any time, and the cost is about $1,500 per meter. Dennis, is, that, is the conduit and the stuff going in now, even though we haven't picked a vendor yet? With all the 180 stuff we're doing, are we, are we putting the stuff down, preparing for this? Conduit is going in now, and then the vendor that we choose will pull the wire. Uh, there are three types of communication available, both uh, the, uh, the networks and the Ethernet are options that would require com uh, communication conduit. 
Our Wi-Fi system is already in place, and we think that the Wi-Fi technology has progressed to a point of being a very reliable method, and that's what we will, would like to recommend. In summary, the pre-proposal interviews were held on uh, January 27th. The RFP will be um, uh, due on February 8th. Uh, it will be reviewed by the city staff and the consultant, and then a recommendation will come back to you for approval. This next slide just gives you, uh, gives you a general idea of what, uh, again, what Project 180 uh, will look like when completed. Uh, this is on Park Avenue, uh, looking east. And I'll be happy to respond to questions. This, if this uh, goes forward, when will these begin? To, when will we see, begin to see the installation figures? Well, <clears throat> we. Uh, We've got three uh, street contracts under construction right now. Uh, only Reno three? <laughs> <laughs> yes, only three. Um, I know it seems like more than that, but they would go, they would go in on, uh, on those three. Okay. And we hope to have those three packages completed in the spring or early summer. Okay, thank you. Any other comments or questions for Dennis? Thank you. Dennis, thank you. Pat, you wanted to comment on item X? Excuse me, just a question. Um, this is a resolution authorizing the city to uh, transfer four and a half million dollars in reserves from the hotel motel tax fund uh, to um, fund some additional projects at the fairgrounds. And as I read this, this will exhaust about one half of that reserve fund. Uh, and I just wonder about the prudency of, of if it, we did set up this reserve fund with a specific purpose of being able to pay for debt service if the money wasn't available to use it on building projects? Yeah. Uh, Laura's here to address that. That's a very uh, valid concern, Mr. Ryan, and, and, and we very carefully negotiated that with him. We had our, our uh, financial advisors, PFM, help us on what we believe is, is a proper reserve, and we believe that we're safe. But, Laura, if you want to elaborate. Sure. Uh, when we set that up, of course, the ordinance provides that 6 elevenths of the tax would come into that fund. And so, we were protecting that to make sure that we had enough for the debt service coverage. That amount grew over time. Now, as we went into the recession, we wanted to protect that because the 6 11 that was coming in at that time was just slightly more than what was needed for debt service. So we wanted to make sure that we had adequate coverage. As, as our sales tax was improving, so was our hotel motel tax. And so now we feel very comfortable that we've got more than two times coverage in that fund even after we take out these projects. Uh, these projects have always been on the fairgrounds list of needed capital improvements. They include the uh, Norwick Arena emergency uh, roof repairs and then some um, heat and air replacement in some of the other buildings and the start of a feed barn uh, project. So we feel very comfortable that uh, now that the tax has returned, the hotel tax has returned more to a normal, and it's building up the reserve again, and we have more than two times coverage in that, that it won't be a problem to spend down these reserves. Yeah, I understand you say that we will continue to add money to the reserves. Yes, we will. If the tax continues to perform the way it has, it will continue to add to the reserves. It has always added to the reserves. It's just that during the recession, it added to the reserves in the most minuscule amount. So now that it's returned to normal, it's, it's continuing to add to the reserves. Do we have in mind a limit what those reserves should be in the future as we go forward and when it gets to uh, 9 million or approximately 9 million as it has now? Will we take some of that money and divert it to fairgrounds projects? Um, we haven't established a limit, a cap on what it should be uh, with the um, MAPS 3 projects, there are also fairgrounds improvements in there, so we want to make sure that we uh, allow for some contingencies and, and other um, capital maintenance type activities at the fairgrounds to support the other projects that are ongoing. But the so, fiscal requirement is to have two times coverage. I believe it's <clears throat> one and a half, One and actually. a half, and we're almost approaching two times, so we're doing that plus reserve on top of it. So we feel that we're pretty well covered as far as making sure that the payments on those revenue bonds are secure. I understand that. My question really went a little bit beyond way. that is the other way. You know, do, are we oversaving, or is it, you know, we, I hate to use that term because it it's, uh, encourages people to spend money, but there are times when you can get your reserves too large. 
And I just uh, was curious if we you would know, have a cap on it. Mr. O'Toole's been making sure that that doesn't happen. I understand <laughs> that they, they have a propensity to, to they have, cost they have whatever money they, they have. They have plenty of capital needs out there, and so they're always looking to, to, to do some additional projects. All right. Meg, item D. And this really also was just a quick question to the manager. Is this um, a new project to have an um, um, on-site parts operation? We've got, we're going out for bid uh, for, to select a contractor to provide the personnel management parts and supplies to run an on-site parts operation for our fleet services. And I just didn't know if this was new or if this no, is a... No, it's not new. We've been doing it for several years. Okay. We determined several years ago that it really wasn't cost effective for us to try to keep the um, number and, and variety of parts that on hand for the wide variety of equipment that we have. And so we've been contracting, I believe, for at least three years and possibly five. Okay. Great. Thank you. All right. Laura, good idea. Laura, Laura, two quick questions for you. You, uh, Jim talked about one and a half times over, and then this talks about two times over. What does that mean? It means that we have enough um, revenue in that fund to pay debt service for a year and a half, essentially. So it's one and a half times an annual debt service payment. And is there any option on these bonds to pay them off early? Um, I, I believe that there's a call date, but I think it might be later than 2015. I'm, I'm not really very well versed on the terms of those bonds right now. Thank you. So. Right. Yes, Skip. Mayor, could I get uh, a little explanation on uh, Jay? Is it? I think this is J1. Right. There's a couple of projects to do some, some sidewalk improvements on, on a couple of areas, one on, in Ward 7 and one in Ward 2. Dennis, that's a planning grant, is it not? <clears throat> Council Mayor, you just wanting to know location or... What we're, what we're getting ready to do or yes um, is it j1 the scope of the yeah, project yeah it's just uh it's a um uh sidewalk ada type project bike bike lanes i can get you a a more detailed description if you'd like so it will be sidewalks it is the sidewalk correct and this is on yeah on kelly from uh, 23rd south to 17th and then 17th from Lincoln over to Kelly. Okay. Anybody else want to comment on the consent docket? All right, we have a motion and a second for every item on the consent docket except for G and H. So let's vote for the, the bulk of it minus G and H. Ready to vote? Cast your votes. Passed unanimously. If I could now get a motion on G and H. Okay, we have a motion and a second on G and H. Cast your votes. And it passes unanimously. Move on to the concurrence docket, which is empty today. We move on to item eight. These are items that require a separate vote. We start with a parking issue that's in Ward 7. Skip, you okay with this one? Yes. All right. How about a motion then? Yeah, we have a motion and a second. We're voting on item 8A. Is there any other further comment or questions? All right, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Item 8B is a public hearing regarding dilapidated structures. We have one person who's signed up to speak. Is there anyone else uh, wishing to speak on any item listed under dilapidated structures? All right. Chris Wood, would you come forward? Good morning, Chris. We'll need your name and address for the record. Certainly. <clears throat> Chris Wood, 6809 Woodbrook in right. War Acres, Oklahoma. All right. And which property are you referring to? The first one on the list, 1129 Southwest Binkley. Okay, that's in Ward 6. Councilwoman Salyer can help you. Um, if I might, 90%, uh, 99% of uh, this has been taken care of. Um, the uh, danger of collapse has been repaired. Um, the, uh, that, stop right there on that picture. That whole back you would not recognize today. The wall where the door is, I've completely rebuilt the sill plate on the bottom, reframed it, and uh, enclosed the whole thing so it's secured. The windows have all been secured. The graffiti has all been painted out. 
and uh, the foundation has all been tuck pointed that um, this is the interior and I'm uh, interested to find it interesting we go inside houses now but uh, the uh, as you can see it's had a lot of uh, artwork done to it but um, it's actually structurally sound on the inside that has all been replaced. That's a good example up close. There's a member that went across the bottom there that was all rotted out. That's been replaced and all closed in. That's the same thing. It's been all covered over and replaced. That's been repaired. What I'm asking is that um, that's been secured and closed. And all the debris we've probably, that's the same picture as before. Um, all the debris has been carried away from there. Um, it's on the, we've got it out in the front. Uh, we've taken probably a trailer load out so far, and we've got another one or two trailers, and so we've cleaned this thing up. That, for instance, that tree there on the side, uh, on the left there, is, is gone and completely gone, and the whole area has been completely cleaned up. Chris, what's the condition of the roof? The roof actually doesn't leak, and uh, I replaced five roofs last year, and this one's on my list to replace. I was planning on replacing it this summer. If you look at that, there is no sagging in the roof. Now, the front porch I still need to do work on, um, and, but uh, the, uh, the roof itself, it's ugly, and I will replace it, but I was planning on replacing it in the summer when it's warmer and the shingles lay down better. And oh. you didn't bring us any pictures today of the progress of the work? I, I, I didn't. I, I have them on the camera, but I didn't get a chance to get them developed. Charles, have you had a chance to go out and inspect since these pictures were taken? Uh, no, that's usually, it's this is a week ago, the condition. Uh, like I said, we can leave it on within the 30 days. You know, we'll go back out and recheck it, and if, um, and if he's satisfied the, the conditions, uh, of course, we'll, we'll clear it. Okay. You know, Chris, there's no risk at all you know, to having it on here, assuming that all the work is done the way it needed to be done, and there's a 30-day period in which you can do anything else that you need to have done to be sure that we clear it. Um, but I don't detect that's what you'd like to do. So. I, I don't want it declared dilapidated. If you could continue it for 30 days, then I'll have plenty of chance to go out with him. There's two, three more items I'd like to take care of, and I think you can wipe it off your books. Okay. But I don't want it declared dilapidated because... Somebody's going to use that against me at some point in the future. Charles, do you have a problem with continuing for 30 days and going out to take a look at it? Uh, not if he's done what he said, he, then I wouldn't have a problem with that. I, I have known Chris for a long time, and um, I, I know he does this. Uh, we have seen you here before, Chris. <laughs> this isn't yes. the first time that you've been here, but um, I would, yeah. I think you'll be pleased with, with what's taking place there. Okay. Well, let me do this then. Uh, let me continue for, ask for a continuance for two weeks rather than 30 days, and you'll have a chance to go out and take a look at it. If you could give me three weeks, I've got a, I'm a Boy Scout master, and I've got to camp out this weekend, and the next weekend I'd be able to get the remaining work done. Well, if he's already listened to his description, I mean, two weeks should be enough because we can probably clear it off from the work he's done. I would agree with that, so I'd, I'd like to go okay. with two weeks, if you don't mind. That's fine. Everybody okay with that? Okay, so is this a, a two-week deferral on this item? Yes. Am I hearing it correctly? Okay. Let's vote on the two-week deferral for item 8B1. Hmm. Cast your votes. Pass it unanimously. Thank you. All right, how about a motion now on the rest of them? Second. All right. Cast your votes on item B through T. Passed unanimously. On item 8C, this is a public hearing regarded long-term boarded structures. We have one item listed. It's in Ward 6. Meg? I assume it's customary with these long-term boarded structures that we do this. I'd move approval of the item. All right. They're pretty motion rare. Second. We're voting on item 8C. Cast your votes. Pass unanimously. On to item 8D, this is a public hearing regarding unsecured structures. Looks like we have 16 items listed. A couple of people, are these? No. no, they've not signed up to speak on this. So no one has signed up to speak. Is there anyone here wishing to speak under any item listed under 8D? All right. Sounds like we're good to go. Cast your votes. Pass unanimously. Item 8E is um, to uh, terminate the Oklahoma City Development Trust. It's an item we brought up a few weeks ago. and. 
held a meeting to dispose of some assets and uh, ready to, to eliminate it from the books. All right, cast your votes on item 8E. Passed unanimously. Item 8F settles a lawsuit. Do stand, we do not need executive session on this item, do we? Do not. All right. Cast your votes on 8F. It stands passed. Go to item 8G. I understand we do need executive session on That's this? That's correct. Okay. All right. Moving item 8G to executive session. Passed unanimously. And item 8H, I understand we do need executive session. Yes, yes. sir. All right, vote on that, and it passes unanimously. Move to item 8I. This is claims recommended for denial. Charles Starr. Charles here. Charles, would you come forward, please? Yes, please. This is good right here. Charles, if you give us your name and address for the record, please. My name is Charles W. Starr, two R's. I live in Wichita Falls, Texas. All right, and uh, <clears throat> you have a claim that's been recommended for denial. What can you tell us about that? Good morning. Good morning. I'm honored to be here. Oklahoma City is a great city, and I spent quite a bit of time here. A lot of great times over the years in the city in this area. I'm a veteran of the military. I did spend some time at Tinker Air Force Base. It was a long time ago. State Fair is a great asset to the city and the state. I've worked in the fair and carnival business for over 25 years. I've always enjoyed the Oklahoma State Fair. On the evening of September 24th, I was stopped and questioned by the police officers outside the State Fair office as stated in the information. I explained that I was looking for one of the chaplains in the chaplain's office and that the chaplains were not there. No big deal. I visited with chaplains many occasions, not all the time and not every day. I've had established a liaison with one certain individual, and I was looking for him on this evening. I'm sorry I don't have the name of the person, but a good Christian relationship does not require labels. I requested and was given some permission to obtain a drink and a snack. I got a drink and a snack and left the office. That was it. It stated on the information that I could, could not provide contact information on myself. That is not true. I had suitable ID with me, but I was not per allowed to obtain it in my bag by the police officers. I cannot be made a criminal if I'm not permitted to comply properly. I did give the officers all the personal information they requested of me, and it was verified on the spot. If it hadn't been verified, I'd probably gone for a ride that evening. I did have and gave complete and detailed information as to who I was working with at the fair. I was offered, also offered phone number at, phone numbers to call the employer at the time. They declined. Again, I cannot be made a criminal if they fail to perform their duty. My employment was verified the next morning at the State Fair office. When searching through my bag, the officers came across a State Fair uniform shirt. This is the blue shirts that the Midway employees wear at the State Fair. I did, as I said, I did not produce this item. They came across it in my bag. I've learned in my life that it's not fair to misrepresent oneself. The uniform shirts are not property of the State Fair. They're not property of the State Fair office, and they're not even property of the Carnival show. They are purchased and owned by the individuals themselves. The individuals you see wearing them at the State Fair and the Midway own them, period. I've owned all, purchased and owned all the shirts and uniforms that I've ever worked at any state, at any fair. It was not explained to me at the time, as I stated in the information, that Possession of a shirt is a condition of employment. A good reason for confiscation of my shirt was never given. A promise to return it to me promptly was made by the police officers. It was also explained to me that the confiscation of the uniform, of, I'm sorry, confiscation of any property requires logging of the property and placement in the property inventory. 
I learned later also that the State Fair Office is open to the public. It houses the Police Department, the Chaplain's Office, the Fire Department, the Rescue Service, Ambulance Service, Lost and Found, and of course the Chaplain's Office. To make a restriction against anybody is not reasonable and a violation of the public's right to access. I did not make any claim or misinformation of employment pertaining to the shirt or uniform. I brought the shirt with me in hopes of gaining a job at the State Fair on the Carnival Midway. This didn't happen this year. The fact that I had my shirt with me in the bag is just a matter of consequence. I do acknowledge that the higher authority of the State Fair does have the authority to terminate employment and restrict access to the fair. I've never seen where anyone confiscates a shirt when they lose their job or when the job is over, for that matter. As I said, they're owned by the individuals. I've offered to sell them back, give them back, and they don't even want them. I did not, as I said, I did not present myself as an employee at all, and as I said, the Oklahoma, my understanding from the Oklahoma City Police Department did not have authority to confiscate the shirt. However, they did, but they were obligated to return it. Since the police department did not have authority to confiscate my shirt, or for that matter, return it, it is my feeling that they failed to properly exercise and perform their duty as explained in the statute that was given to me in the information. And since they failed to properly log it, I feel that restitution is due to me from the police department. Let me get some information from our staff. I might be able to fill in some of the gaps. What can you tell us about this? Good morning, Amy Harrison, Municipal Counselor's Office. Um, the information that we received was that um, Mr. Starr was a state fair board representative, um, came out to speak with Mr. Starr and the police officers, and, and it cannot be verified. Or, I'm sorry, he was not an employee of the State Fair at that time. That's oh. what was verified. And so um, the State Fair board representative um, according to the information we received, um, indicated that possession of the state fair shirt was contingent upon employment, and given that the state statute provides that the state fair board has control of the fair, they have the authority also to take the shirt back. Okay. And the officer gave it to the state fair board representative, and the state fair board representative retain possession. Do these employees or potential employees or past employees, do they pay for the shirts themselves? That information I don't have. Okay. And um, so it was, uh, it was, we don't deny that we took the shirt from him or that our police officers took the shirt from him. And handed it to the State Fair Board representative who requested that the shirt be returned to the State Fair Board. Okay. And uh, we're denying the claim based on what? Um, based on the fact that the information that we had at the time was that he was not an employee and at the request of the State Fair Board representative, the shirt needed to be returned to the State Fair Board because he was not an employee of the State Fair. So it, it really, it wasn't us that took the shirt. We didn't right. keep possession of it. Do we legally as a council have a discretion to uh, um, refund the $25 if we chose? No. And we don't based on what, what law? based on the authority provided to the State Fair Board uh, by state statute. Okay, so by state statute, we're not allowed as a governing body to discretionarily uh, return the $25. Correct, the State he... Fair Board has control of the fair. Okay. Amy, but the State Fair could, I mean, this claim could be made against the State Fair Board? Correct. Is what I'm hearing? And the information we received was that this was explained to Mr. Starr at the time. Okay. What is the, questions uh, from council? Yes. Yeah, skip. What does the twenty-five dollars <throat> come from? I, I don't. I don't know. We don't have any documentation. I think Mr. Starr says that he paid twenty-five dollars for the shirt. To who? 
when, when he bought the shirt for the um, for employment? The carnival that was contracted to come in to the state fair is in control of the carnival midway. All the carnival midways have to have those shirts. You buy them from the carnival. At the time did, you, did you purchase the shirt from the state fair board? No, the, the carnival. So you, the shirt that you had was had the name of a different company. What was the name of the Correct. company? Uh, Wade Shows. Wade Shows. Wade Shows. It's the Carnival Midway, the rides and okay. games. And so you, pay, you paid $25 yes. for the shirt to show that you was a, an employee of that company. Is that right? Yes. Or that vendor. Is that right? I'm sorry? You paid $25 because you was an employee of that vendor? Mm -hmm. that Not this year. Last year. Previous last year. Well, yeah. Right. I've got more than one shirt. And so this whole issue was about someone from the State Fair Board did a check of the employees in the midway to determine who was actually employed or who was not employed? The information we received was that um, the State Fair Board representative did not recognize Mr. Starr as a current employee. And uh, my understanding is that he checked to see if he was an employee. Um, at that time and could not verify his employment. And the area was a restricted area. It was supposed to be restricted to safety personnel and law enforcement. Well, Any other comments or questions on the item? I, I do have one other point that I would like to, and I don't know whether or not this was just a misstatement or it was what was stated in the original claim. But I just <clears throat> find it a pretty hard statement to state in this uh, uh, report that that the officer stole a shirt. You know, the, the, the proper terminology could have been, you know, if the officer asked you to remove the shirt. Is that what I mean? I don't know. Okay. I, I didn't write this. Okay. And I just think that's. That's a very, very, you know, that's a dangerous word when you start using that to label the activities of one of our police officers. And from what I've understood is they, he was asked to remove the shirt. And I just don't like this language that, that's stated in here that, you know, somebody stole the shirt. From the individual. Do you have a copy of this? Is this the copy? Okay. Yeah. I see the copy. Chief. May I look at a copy of what you? Well, our, our advice is from staff is that we don't have discretion on this issue. I'll accept the motion from council on how they want to proceed. Okay. We have a motion, a second to deny. Any other comments or questions from council? All right. So a yes vote is to deny the claim. Cast your votes. Claim is denied unanimously. We done? On to item nine of the council uh, agenda, this is claims recommended for approval. There are two items listed. Any comments or questions on item nine? All right, cast your votes. Passed unanimously. Item 10 is items from council. First is issue with some uh, park property in Ward 7. Skip, you want to speak on this item? Uh, <clears throat> well, some time ago, I asked for an inventory of some of the parks in Ward 7 to get a better understanding of where some of the, uh, the manpower was being used and where uh, some areas could probably be best uh, served without having to spend a lot of time on some of the park areas that really are not being used. And um, the uh, Parks Department did a, a very thorough study and came back and reported that there were, I believe it's four parks that had been identified as parks that were in areas that um, were not really connected to communities, that they had not been used for a long period of time. Uh, the city was, you know, maintaining them the best that they could, but, you know, we felt like that these were areas that really did not see a future of, um, 
of, of redevelopment in reference to park usage, and therefore, uh, you know, this was taken to the, uh, to the Parks Commission, and it was recommended that these parks be de declared as surplus. Okay. If, if um, this property were sold, I assume, on an open market, where would those proceeds be placed? Where, where in the... They, they, they would be put into an escrow account for future park uses. Okay. Any comments or questions on item 10A from the rest of the council? Uh, in, the, in the event that these, the, the sales are made, uh, is it my understanding that those funds would be earmarked for Ward 7 projects? Not necessarily. That, that, that would be up to the council's Ward, discretion. Now, I, you, 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 could, you can encourage your council members to, to go in that direction, but, but uh, that's a council, <laughs> council decision. <laughs> Selling my property, keep it in my in my hood. I don't think it works that way. But you want to you want to make a motion in, on the I resolution as stated. Make a motion. All right. We have a second. Second. All right. Cast your votes on item 10A. Passed unanimously. Item 10B has been brought to us from Councilman Ryan. Pat. Your Honor, thank you. This is a res rescinding a resolution that we adopted uh, previously uh, back in March to uh, make a uh, voluntary. Uh, rebate of 5% of the salaries of the council. And uh, that was in anticipation of uh, <coughs> the possibility, very strong possibility, that we were going to have to ask city employees for either concessions in their wages or to accept furlough days. And it was my feeling that this kind of an action would put this, the uh, council in a leadership role. Uh, we, uh, fortunate enough, we didn't have to ask for concessions. And we had, didn't have to ask for furlough days. And from that standpoint, I would uh, suggest it's time now to uh, rescind the resolution that we adopted in March and go back to our accepting our full salaries. We a have actually we did ask, ask for concessions, but just that the economy yeah. improved so that we, we, we settled uh, we settled on rollover positions. Thank you, Mr. But uh, and then there was a at least uh, one of my colleagues uh, uh, put in the entire amount at the beginning of the program, and this resolution would provide for a refund of those uh, uh, payments he made. Uh, after the uh, ad effective date of this resolution, if it is adopted. Okay. Uh, Gary, do you want to comment? Well, yeah, I, I, I certainly support uh, Pat's effort here, but I'd li I'm going to make an amendment, and, then I, and I'll explain why, and then I'll make the motion. Um, uh, as Pat said, this was put out there with the assumption that we were going to uh, try to um, get or ask for some employee um, reductions. And raises in uh, compensation, and we needed to set the example. And that, since that didn't happen, I certainly concur that we need to think about rescinding this resolution. Um, but I, I'd like to see it. I'm going to uh, make the motion that we mend it back to the original date and and just to rescind the resolution entirely and refund all of the monies given up to this point. We've had uh, a couple of uh, council people who have declined to voluntarily. Uh, donate to this, and I think, in all fairness, we just need to give it all back if if the uh, if it's appropriate that we don't need it for this year's uh, either budget or for um, to to take the example by lead. Then I think we need to uh, uh, not uh, uh, accept it from from anybody from the original date forward. So I, I make a motion to amend it back to the original date of the, uh, and just rescind the entire resolution and refund all dollars given it up to this point. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to uh, change the date of the resolution that Councilman Ryan has proposed. Any comments or questions on the motion? All right, we'll vote on the motion then, which would change the date back to June 1. Cast your votes. And the motion passes 7 2. All right, so now we need to vote on the, the item itself. I can't do that. As amended. Okay. We have a motion. We have a second. Second. Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. <laughs> I can rewrite that resolution to conform to your amendment. All right. Any other items from council? Gary? Sam? I have two, Mayor. One is a comment on the um, 
manager's report with regards to on-street bike route improvements. Uh, just to make it clear for anybody listening that this is, uh, I, I would hope, simply a hiccup in our, in our movement forward. We have taken down and are taking down some signs that were mistakenly uh, uh, signed. And uh, after we revisit a revised ordinance to put us in compliance with the uh, federal language on, on signage, uh, we'll be back here with the full implementation plans for uh, on-street bike routes. I think it's even beyond that, Mr. Bowman. We're going to have, I think, some ordinance changes that's going to be very clear as to what the city's intent is for protecting bicyclists and so that we're making sure that everybody is clear as to what the rules and, and, and the game plan is as you uh, encounter bicyclists out in the roadway. Thank you, Jim. And in that regard, I think the, the city needs to, to mount a major public information program to make sure everybody is aware of it. The sign sort of surprised people, I think, last time it they were popped up without much announcement. And I think uh, to explain the intent of the signs, uh, to explain the reason that we're doing this, I think it's crucially important if we're going to get a widespread acceptance. And, we, and, and I think that uh, will go a long ways towards ensuring the safety of the bicyclists, if everybody understands the rules. I think we were going to do that anyway, but I think it, now it's even more important that we go forward in that direction. It's been my understanding that there's a, the subcommittee, Sam, that I think you've participated in and others uh, include some industry folks, uh, bike does. enthusiasts. And, and some budget to do it, Mr. Ryan. Yeah, budget to put a campaign together, which is great. Uh, Mr. Manager, do you sure. know what the, um, the concerns from the state position is for as we're, we're trying to make sure that the, we want to make sure, Mr. Jordan can jump in here, that our city ordinances are in concurrence with state law. Correct. Yes. I think there's some confusion on whether you get to have a full lane or whether you have to you get a, a buffer around the bicyclists. <laughs> and so we want to make sure that we're clear on that as to what the rules are. Yes. And uh, also, we want to make sure that the, the signs that are being put out are consistent with what our code says, too. So we won't have 20 signs in a mile and a half. I think we're going to establish route. criteria for the for exactly when those signs need to be put out and, and, and the spacing thereof. Well, who went out and put the signs out that's out now? Our contractor put those out, and I and I think we were probably a little over aggressive without uh, understanding necessarily the ramifications of those signs. Okay. Mayor. Yes. Uh -huh. Is that all on that? I'd just like to uh, say a few things with regard to uh, law enforcement. Two weeks ago, uh, this council recognized Officer Katie Lawson for her heroic actions. And uh, we, we, we stood and the audience stood for her in, in a very gracious, outpouring manner. And I would be certain that anybody watching council that day probably felt the same. Following week, the thunder before 20,000 people uh, recognized Officer Katie Lawson and, uh, and, and Chief City as well. Sunday, the um, re front page report interview with, the, with our chief, Bill City, with regards to some more information on that uh, shooting of Officer Lawson that uh, she actually took six rounds, uh, shots, and uh, as Chief said, never in his 33 years has he experienced uh, an incident with a police officer so outgunned uh, as this incident. Uh, I, I just want, I want to commend our, our, our Chief uh, for, for, for uh, not only the courage to step forward on this, but to uh, make such a statement with regards to these I don't know how to uh, refer to them other than knockoff military M16 type rapid fire assault guns. Uh, that there's no place for that kind of weapon in, in, in our civil communities. And as we stood two weeks ago and, and honored Katie Lawson, it just seems to me with respect to where law enforcement, and this has felt much more broadly than, than our own chief. I understand it's, it's across 
lines in law enforcement across this country with regards to these kind of assault weapons. That if we want to give the same kind of honor, not only to Officer Lawson, but to all the men and women in uniform in this city, protecting our lives every day, I would hope that we'd give some serious consideration as individuals, both as council people as well as uh, in individual citizens, to write our congressmen and, and let them know uh, our concern about this kind of special assault weapon, that it really has no place in, in our civil society today. And to do honor uh, 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 to, to all the officers, as, as we've done with Officer Katie Lawson, um, I would just hope that we would follow that. If I could comment on that just for, for, for a minute, that, it's, that's an issue that, that, that can become very controversial, as you know, you know Mr. Bowman. And there, there are multiple sides to that story, and, and I think Chief City did a very good job of bringing up the awareness of those, of those assault weapons on there. But he also pointed out that there is a, a, a right for citizens to bear arms, that the Second Amendment is out there. And somewhere in, in the middle of that, between that right and the Second Amendment, and the controls that we have on weapons and registrations of weapons and, and, and such, that's what we're talking about, some type of, of, of middle ground there that can, can be achieved and address that issue that he brought up, I think, very clearly in, 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 uh, regarding the situation about the unregistered weapon that was used in that assault and, and making sure we balance between that and, and the Second Amendment. It's a very difficult situation, and I think you brought up a very good, good ses uh, suggestion of, of, of going forth to address that issue. Jim, I would hope this would have nothing to do with, with the argument about Second Amendment right to bear arms. It's not about the right to own an, uh, a weapon to protect your own home, own a weapon to, to hunt in, in, in a sporting way. Uh, this is a very, very different piece of weaponry that's out there that is m military in nature and just separate from all. No, I, I agree completely. I, I think we heard what you said and what, what, what Bill said. It's just that this has always becomes a, you know, an issue, and, and we've, we've got to be careful as we go forward. Larry? Yes, thank you, Your Honor. Uh, as you all know, I'm, I'm the representative on your MAPS Oversight Committee, and so as, as that representative, I attend the oversight meetings once a month. Uh, this past week, uh, I've stepped outside of that role a little bit and uh, sat in on the subcommittee uh, dealing with the uh, modern streetcar. And uh, it was a very uh, informative meeting to sit in on. And uh, the committee is, is very uh, enthusiastic and very diligent in trying to bring back to us at some point in time uh, a recommendation through the process uh, to, uh, to build out the, uh, the modern streetcar. And one of the things that came up, and I don't know whether Eric's had a chance to talk to you or not, Jim, but one of the things that came up in our conversation, Eric and mine afterwards, was maybe we as a council on a monthly basis with these, all these different subcommittees going at different speeds and looking at their particular areas might benefit from having Eric come in on a monthly basis and just give us an overview of where the different subcommittees are and their thinking and what the progress is. But the progress is being made on that. Uh, they are well aware of the issues that have been discussed here at the Horseshoe. And uh, I think we can look forward in the future to some good recommendations coming from that particular subcommittee. Thank you, Your Honor. Thanks. If I could respond to that for a minute, too. We, we are very much concerned of, of, about making sure that the council is up to speed on all the MAPS three issues. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, we did have Rick Kane come in and give a report on the modern streetcar and on the hub study that, that's out there. And Eric gave an update on the MAPS three progress a couple of weeks before that. So I, that is very important, but I really appreciate you bringing that uh, to our attention. And we will be diligent about doing that in the future. Pete? Uh, a couple of things. <clears throat> One is, um, I just want to uh, add my comments to what Sam said about uh, uh, the kind of restrictions that we ought to be talking about. And also, I tell you, I think I, I, that, that uh, Chief City needs uh, uh, needs to be complimented for the courage in a that it took to even bring that up, because we live in a time when. Um, the language surrounding Second Amendment rights are, are out of control, in my opinion. It, it's so controversial that it takes real courage for someone like him to bring that up and talk about it in a public place. And I, I appreciate the fact that we have a chief in Oklahoma City that has the courage to do that. And I, I just want to 
make that statement and support what Sam said about it. All right. Uh, secondly, um, uh, I, I agree with what Larry said because I've had some very, very um, uh, good uh, contacts with people involved in the Modern Streetcar Program about uh, about some of the issues that I've raised, and I too think that we will come to a solution that will be that will make us all uh, 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 satisfied uh, under the circumstances that uh, we have the best we can get. Um, again, I say under the circumstances. Um, thirdly, anyone that missed seeing um, Leanne Womack and George Strait and Reba McIntyre last Saturday night missed a great show. Four and a half hours of solid music. It was absolutely wonderful. The place was virtually full. Um, it... Um, uh, it, it, what a great venue that is. I know it's got a lot more things that are going to be done to it over the next 12, uh, 12 14 months, but it is an absolutely wonderful venue, and that was, uh, and I think our ability to bring things like that to Oklahoma City were, were rewarded Saturday night with that, with that show. It was just uh, absolutely, not that I like country music or anything either. All right, Brian? Well, uh, it might be surprising that I would take the complete opposite side of the uh, firearms issue. Um, a couple of things. Number one is uh, it took incredible courage for um, Officer Lawson to do what she did. But I think that we're missing a, a little bit of an issue here. Um, the firearm itself is not to blame. It's the, it's the nut behind the firearm. And we start making laws. We start making restrictions on things. It restricts the law-abiding citizen. I personally own a few of these types of firearms, enjoy shooting them. Um, it in no way causes me uh, to have the tendency to go out and hurt somebody with them. Um, my 11-year-old son also shoots it. and He's very responsible with firearms. And I think it has everything to do with the Second Amendment. The Second Amendment has no restriction on it. It says the right to bear arms. It doesn't say what somebody thinks is necessary. It doesn't think, say what somebody thinks is appropriate. And I have other weapons that are not considered assault rifles, they're just as deadly. But it's about being responsible with them. And we start limiting one, and pretty soon we're limiting it all. And so if we want to talk about necessary, and Pat, I hate to throw you under the bus on this, but you know, I think about, I think about the, the vehicle that Pat drives. Pat has worked very hard his whole life. He drives a very nice vehicle. Um, it's a Porsche. It's probably twice as much as the average car. And my guess is the speedometer says 180 or so. And to me, I could say, Pat, that's not necessary for you to have that car. But the bottom line is, is it's America, and he can drive that car. Could he kill somebody with it? Absolutely. He could go 180 and hurt somebody with it. But it's not, but we can't do that. We can't limit what a law-abiding citizen can do simply because of, there may be somebody out there that does drive that car at 180 miles an hour. So luckily, I think that you can write your congressman if you want, but we have a great delegation who's going to stand behind the Second Amendment. And hopefully... Uh, Hopefully they will not pursue what uh, President Clinton did with, with the assault weapons ban. Because at the end of the day, somebody who is willing to trade their life to hurt somebody else, you're not going to be able to stop them. You're just not. And it doesn't matter what weapon they use or what they have their hands on. If they want to hurt somebody, they're going to be able to do it. So, uh, you know, we did put forth the effort to arm our officers with the same type of firepower. They're trained with it, should be proficient with it. And, and personally, I would like nothing more than for somebody to drop that guy right where he stood. That would have been the best scenario. Unfortunately, it didn't work that way. But to, to come after something that, that a vast majority of citizens do not use inappropriately because there's a few nuts out there is completely inappropriate. Okay. That's what I'm going to say about that. Sec uh, I do have a second thing I'd like to say. Um, last Wednesday, I had probably one of the best experiences of my life. Um, I had the opportunity to go out with the Oklahoma City Fire Department Station 23, thanks to those guys, thanks to uh, uh, Lieutenant Milner, who was responsible for making sure that Councilman Walters got back in one piece. He did a great job. Um, but we had the opportunity to go out and go to a live fire um, burn training exercise out on Tinker. The um, units that are going to be torn down and replaced with on-base housing, they allow uh, the fire department to come in, set those on fire, and actually do live training. Um, unlike... Uh, Unlike you know, some spectator that would just like to sit outside and watch them do it, um, I, uh, I actually was able to put on bunker gear. I had a uh, full, you know, full breathing apparatus, helmet, the whole nine yards. 
uh, they made fun of me a little bit because when I got there, the bunker gear, bunker gear looked brand new. The helmet had never been worn before. But it was my, my job to make sure that that thing looked 10 years old when I was done. Um, had the opportunity to go in. Um, like I said, it is a live fire. It's a live burn exercise. Uh, the fire is, is going. I had the opportunity to set one. Had the opportunity to go in on search and rescue. And uh, all the rest of them that were done, there was about 10 in all. I was actually in the room with, the, with it going. But the most fun was when they actually had me on the front end of the hose and was able to go in there. And I was responsible for, uh, for making sure that the fire got put out. Um, pretty intense. But uh, it, it definitely gives you a different sense of those guys and what they do, the responsibility that they have, and the chaos that can ensue in even just a small fire like what we, what we dealt with. Um, so it does give you a, a different, different viewpoint. So much appreciation to them um, for their hospitality, for the work that they do. And if uh, any of them are watching, I've, it's been six days and I've taken eight or nine showers and I'm still watching smoke smell out of my hair. So thanks to Station 23 on that. All right. Meg? I noticed Brian. Keep washing. <laughs> Keep going. John just wanted to make a couple of comments. That last Monday night, uh, folks around this horseshoe uh, had an opportunity to have a joint meeting with the Oklahoma City uh, Public School Board. Um, I thought it was a very informative and a productive meeting, and I just wanted to thank uh, Chairman Monson again and Superintendent Springer for affording us the opportunity and encouraging Mayor and the City Manager to allow us to continue to have those meetings. I think this council has clearly signaled that um, providing some level of assistance uh, in um, achieving higher standards um, in our public school system is really important to us, and I think we're on the right track, but we have a, we have a lot of work to do. And, I think we'd all enjoy continuing to be involved. Um, and the second thing, and I, again, I'd like to thank Chief City. He may come in here with a giantly swollen head, um, but I have had the opportunity in the last um, two and a half years um, to have a couple of neighborhoods, um, beginning with South Oklahoma City and then most recently North Oklahoma City, come to me with some serious elevation in crime activity. And um, Chief City and his staff have immediately gotten on the situation. They've run the statistics. Um, he has said several times, you know, these folks um, absolutely had a, had a reason to call. We really do have a problem. And um, they recognize it. Uh, Major McCool over at Will Rogers has really uh, stepped in and done a great job. And I just want to thank everybody for, for paying attention when we really have a serious problem. All right. Skip? I would like to, to reemphasize what I said a couple of weeks ago in reference to uh, the MAPS um, oversight committees and the subcommittees. And that is that I think it would be appropriate for uh, the subcommittees to meet periodically in a workshop with the council. And therefore, we would all get a little more of an update and have an opportunity to have a dialogue with some of the issues and some of the concerns that um, the many of us may have, and, and not to take away from the authority of the subcommittees, but because of, of, of a couple of the engagements that we've, we've had here on the council, I think it would be, you know, probably the best way of, of keeping the council a little bit more involved and informed of some of the changes or some of the concerns that, that uh, the subcommittee is, is working with. I mentioned this from the council last week. I've, I've mentioned it to, to my uh, assistant to, to take forward to the manager, but I really think that that would be probably a better way of, of keeping the council in a more uh, informed status of, of, of uh, the, the projects that they're working on without having to wait until, you know, we get a report here at the council, and I think it just gives everybody a little bit more opportunity to have some input and, and yet and still feel like we're part of the process. Okay. Pat? No, just a point of clarification, my car will only go 175 miles an hour. <laughs> and secondly, it didn't cost a whole lot more than my wife's Ford Expedition. <laughs> and thirdly, the federal government has already restricted the kind of firearms private citizens can own to some extent. And that did not cause a cascade of additional federal controls as we would forward. Comment. All right. Uh, citizens to be heard. Uh, Jessica Holston. Holstein. 
Good morning, Jessica. We'll need your name and your address for the record, please. Jessica Holstein, 1414 Northwest 14th Street. Pull the oh. microphone down a little bit, probably help. Sorry. There you go. Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, 73106. Are you ready? Sure. Okay. I'm in the low middle class range of living. With the help of my fiance, it'd be very hard to survive financial wise. I would actually like I would actually be considered low class without him. Being low class, I could not afford a home of my own. I had to have financial assistance to buy a home in Oklahoma City. I bought a home here that was around $75,000 because that is all I could afford. I have a car payment of $145 a month, a house payment of $580 a month. I buy the Oklahoma newspaper so I may receive coupons every Sunday to buy groceries that cost around $400 a month. I attended UCO this fall semester to pursue an education that one day will allow me to afford this lifestyle without stress. I have little to no money left to enjoy what Oklahoma City offers to its citizens as well as tourists. I was informed by someone that the mayor will be giving a speech about Oklahoma City and the progress it has made within the past year. This will be conducted, this was conducted at Cox Convention Center and I did my own little research and read and found it on the Oklahoma City OKC.gov website, and I asked myself, why has it not been made more public, maybe advertisement on television? You would think more citizens should know about this when it concerns the city. I would have assumed it would have been advertised more freely. Then I began asking myself more questions, because that is what I do when I'm unsure of something. My, my question for you all is, why is the Greater Oklahoma City Chamber of Commerce hosting an event concerning the well-being of Oklahoma City, and why on earth do I have to pay $75 to listen to the mayor speak? What justifies that amount of money? Is it the food? Is it the cost of food? Because I won't eat it. Um, I was just wondering, because like I said, I have all these payments, and I'm, a, I'm in the lower class. I can't afford $75 to attend such an event. So my, that was my question. Why did it? Did you guys, why did the Chamber of Commerce charge $75 to attend, if, since I'm not a member, to attend this? Yeah, we can get you that answer. Any other comments you'd like to make about it? Yes, please. Um, it's kind of, it's actually, um, also during the speech, I, since I saw it online, I saw that it mentioned, you, the mayor, mentioned about the Oklahoma City Police and how good of a job they've been doing, which they have, considering. Um, which brings me to ask, um, I didn't hear anything about how less police and firefighters have, we have less police and firefighters since 1990. And with the growth of Oklahoma City, we have more people moving to Oklahoma City like I did. I moved here. And I was wondering, why is that? Why, why do we have less with so many people that are moving here? You would think we would need more. And so if you can answer that for me as well, please. We'll get you that answer, too. Okay. Thanks for coming down. Thank you. We have executive session. We'll be back. My, my